Indonesia Project and the Institute of Economics and Social Research at the University of Indonesia. Distinguished speakers around the world come to Indonesia every year to share their insights on Indonesia's development. The lecture draws a large crowd from academia and the government of Indonesia to join the open and public debate. This year's Sali lecture is joined with the Mubiarto Public Policy Forum in honor of Professor Mubiarto, who had great influence on uh, development policy in Indonesia as well. The Mubiarto Forum is jointly convened by the ANU Indonesia Project and the Faculty of Economics and Business of the Gajamada University. So we're honored to have Professor Justin E. Fuing today as our speaker. Professor Ling has had a distinguished career in both the academia and in the development sector and has great influence on policies gu uh, guiding China's reform since the 1980s. He's widely known internationally as the chief economist of the World Bank from 2008 to 2012 and is the author of numerous papers and books, especially on his theory of new structural economics. Currently, he's the Dean of Institute of New Structural Economics, Dean of Institute of South-South Cooperation and Development, and Professor and Honorary Dean of National School of Development at Peking University. For today's lecture, drawing from his new structural economics framework, Professor Lin will share with us his view on how to use industrial policies to escape the middle income trap. A very important question, perhaps on the minds of many policymakers and academics in Indonesia at the moment. After Professor Ling shares his insights, we'll have two academics from Indonesia to discuss their views on the topic, especially in the context of Indonesia. The first discussant is Dr. Muhammad Adi Pranawan. Dr. Pranawan is a lecturer at the Gajamada University and former vice dean of its Faculty of Economics and Business. He was recently appointed as chairman of the Board of Supervisors of the Indonesian Central Bank. The second discussant is Dr. Kiki Variko. Dr. Variko is a lecturer at University of Indonesia and deputy director of its Research Institute of Economics and Social Research. He also currently serves as expert advisor in industrial and trade policy for the Indonesian Minister of Finance. So I'm sure we'll have a very interesting discussion today. Professor Lin will speak for about 30 minutes, and Dr. Pranawan and Dr. Variko will speak for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll open the floor to, for questions from the audience. So now, without further ado, let's give the floor to Professor Lin. Professor Lin, please. Thank you very much. Let me upload my PPT first. Okay. It's a great honor for me to be invited to give this year's study lecture. It's an honor for me, but I have to say at the beginning, I'm not an expert on Indonesia. So I'm not really qualified to talk about the industrial policies in Indonesia. So my talk, instead of trying to give some guidance I try to give some inspiration about the possibility. We know that Indonesia's per capita GDP, according to the World Bank, was 690 US dollars, measured by 2010 US dollar purchasing power. In that year, the average or low middle income countries was 570 US dollars. That means in 1960, Indonesia was a mid income country already. And uh, Indonesia's GDP growth rate was very impressive, growing at 6.8% for 30 years from 1967 to 1998. During that period, Indonesia was named one of the seven Asian tigers. However, Indonesia was unable to move above the middle income since the 1960s. So Indonesia is one of the middle income countries. 
that has been trapped in the middle income status for decades. Although many middle income countries have been trapped, but the middle income trap is not the destiny. Because we know Japan, Korea, Singapore have been able to move from middle income to high income. And China, Malaysia are likely to become high income country by the time of 2025. And so my lecture today will provide a new structural economic perspective, which I advocate in the last decades and so on, of the reason for the trap and the way to escape it with some implications for Indonesia. When I say to escape the middle income trap, certainly it requires the country to grow dynamically for an extended period of time, so as to achieving convergence to the high income level of the advanced country. But the question is how? And when I try to answer the question, I often say, let's go back to Adam Smith. But I do not mean go back to the Wales of nation, which reflects findings of Adam Smith's research. When I say, let's go back to Adam Smith, I mean, go back to the methodology of Adam Smith that used to find out his conclusion during, in his research and present in his book. And Adam Smith's methodology actually you know, was illustrated in the title of his book, an inquiry into the nature and the causes of the wealth of nation. So if we want to understand the question, we need to understand the nature and the causes of dynamic economic growth in our country. And I think most of us know the rapid dynamic sustaining income growth is a modern phenomenon. It appeared only after the 18th century. And a few, you know, Western European country, North America country were able to grow dynamically and become the advanced country that we see today. And from the historical studies, we know that the nature of dynamic growth in modern time is a process of continuous structural changes in technology and industries, which increase labor productivities and income level. And an improvement in soft and hard infrastructure in the economy, which reduced the transaction cost. So the nature of modern growth is sustained growth in income, but the causes are the continuous structural transformation in technology, industry, infrastructure, and institutions. And I propose to use the new structural economics to study that. And new structural economics is an application of neoclassical economic approach to study the determinants of economic structure and uh, its evolution in the development process. And that is the nature of the modern economic growth. And uh, if I use the neoclassical approach to study structure and structural evolution, I should refer this type of research as structural economics. Just like if you use neoclassical approach to study finance, you refer that as financial economics. To study agriculture, you refer that as agricultural economics. So by that convention, I should refer my studies as structural economics. But because the first generation of development economics is structuralism. And to distinguish my research from structuralism, 
I call my approach new structural economics, just like the new institutional economics. Douglas Knowles proposed to use neoclassical approach to study institution and institutional changes in 1960s. Should have, he should refer that type of research as institutional economics. But because in the US, there was an institutional school at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, to distinguish from the institutional school. So Dr. Arnold proposed that to be the new institutional economics. So new in the new structural economics has the same meaning as the new in the new institutional economics. And my main hypothesis that industrial structure in an economy is endogenous to its endowment structure. And that endowment structure we know certainly is given at any specific time and changeable over time. And how come endowments and its structure is so important? Because endowment structure determine the industries that the countries has competitive advantages. And if all your industry are consistent with the competitive advantages determined by the endowment structure, the cost of production will be the lowest in the world and the economy will be competitive. And certainly you also need to have adequate hot and soft infrastructure to reduce transaction costs and to turn the industries from competitive advantages to become competitive advantages. And certainly our goal is to have a dynamic economic growth to raise the income. If you want to raise the income, you need to raise the labor productivity. For that, you need to have industrial upgrading from agrarian economy to manufacturing economy and move up the industrial ladders from labor intensive gradually to capital intensive technology intensive. But because in industrial structure is endogenous to the endowment structure. So if you want to move from resources intensive or labor intensive industry to capital intensive industries, you need to you know, upgrade your endowment structure from you know, capital skills, labor abundant, or resources abundant, gradually to become capital abundant. And if you can have those kind of upgrading or endowment structures, your competitive advantages changes. The hard and soft infrastructure also need to you know, accommodate these kind of changes in order to reduce transaction cost. So when we see a country was trapped in low income status or middle income status, that means the countries were unable to have a dynamic structural transformation in a speed faster than high income country. And if you could not have a dynamic structural changes faster than high income country, you will be trapped in low income status or middle income status. And from the above analysis, then the implication is that if a country follow the competitive advantages determined by its endowment structure to develop the country industries and also to improve the hard and soft infrastructure accordingly, it will be the best way to achieve dynamic economic growth and convergence. Because by this way, the country will be most competitive, produce the largest possible economic surplus for profits for the firm, and have the highest possible return to capital, and then thus saving, and ensure the fastest upgrading or endowment structure, and achieve the rapidest possible industrial upgrading and income growth. And in this process, a developing country can have the late commerce advantages in its industrial upgrading technology innovation. And so a developing country can grow faster than the high income country and achieve the convergence. But to follow the competitive advantages is a term only understandable to economists. And how can the entrepreneurs in the economy to follow this principle 
spontaneously. Then we need to have an institution. The institution is a competitive market because only if the factor prices can reflect the relative scarcity of the factor endowments, then those kind of factor prices can guide the choice of technology or industry made by the entrepreneur according to the factor endowments of the economy. And we know those kind of relative factor prices can only be obtained in competitive market. So to follow the competitive advantage to develop economy, the country need to have a competitive market system. But we are talking about dynamic structural transformation. And in this process, you need to have entrepreneur to be the first movers. And the first mover need to incur all kinds of risk and cost. So you need to compensate the externality generated by the first mover in order to allow them to the incentive to be you know, risk taking. And also not only so, because for the first mover to be successful, you also need to address the issue of improvement in infrastructure and institution. And for that, require coordination beyond the capacity of individual entrepreneur. And so that we need to have a facilitation state to make following the competitive advantage in the development of the economy become a reality. And uh, by this way of analysis, for a country to play the facilitation state role, industrial policy would be a very useful tool. Because content of coordination in the improvement of hard infrastructural institution will be different from industry to industry and a stage of development to the other stage of development. And uh, the possibility for improvement is almost unlimited, but the government resources and the capacities are limited. And under the kind of situation, the government need to use its limited resources and capacities strategically and to targeting the industry that the country has competitive advantages and to turn them into the competitiveness of the economy. So industrial policy should be a very useful tool. But the sad fact is that almost all the country in the developing world attempted to use industrial policy to play the facilitation role, but most of them failed. And then from the new structural economics, the reason for most countries failed in its industrial policy was sometimes they are too ambitious. For a developing country, they want to develop industry, which is so capital intensive beyond the competitive advantage of their endowments. For example, the aeroplane industry in Indonesia. But for the developing country, the reason for the developed advanced country, the reason sometimes it's just the object. They want to protect jobs in sector which they already lost competitive advantages, like agriculture in Japan. And uh, for those industry, no matter you're too ambitious or you want to protect job, the consequence of going against a country's competitive advantages turn in the target sectors will be non viable in a competitive market because their factor of cost of production will be too high and they cannot compete in domestic market or international markets. And so to develop those kind of target sectors and the government need to provide protection and subsidies to the firm, the non viable firm in the target sectors which go against a country's competitive advantages. And those kind of subsidies and you know, protections certainly cause all kind of distortion, misallocation of resources and rent seeking. And as a result, the attempt to pick winners by industrial policy often end up with picking losers. And that's the reason why industrial policy for a long time become a taboo in global development community. And uh, for the industrial policy to be successful, it should target sector which confirm to the country's latent competitive advantages. What is the latent competitive advantage is that 
according to factor of production, this Yun Tai tree should be among the lowest in the world. But because of the inadequate, uh, 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 the inadequate hot infrastructure institution, the transaction costs are too high. So this industry cannot be competitive, you know, in the market because high transaction cost, you know, coaching the total cost to be too high. And industrial policy should target those kind of sectors. Factor cost already lower in international competitors, but only the transaction costs are too high. But how the government can pick the sector that are in line with the country's legend compared advantages. And for the new structure economics, I divided the industries in the middle income country into five types. One is that this industry exists in high income country and developing countries uh, on the catching up process. And for a middle income country, especially for up middle income country, they may have some industry already are on the global technological frontier. And certainly, a country may also have some industry which already lose compared advantages. And, you know, in the industrial revolution, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, especially, there are some kind of short cycle industry in which uh, the main input is human capital. And the last one is some kind of competitive advantage defying statistical industry. I divide the industry in a middle income country in this five type. And then we can consider what kind of industrial policy would be useful. For the industry which are on the catching up process, historically, the country in the catching up process, in general, they target country with similar endowment structure. So they can have similar competitive advantage. And currently their particular GDP is about 100% higher than theirs. And uh, look into what kind of mature industry that they have. You know, so that is about uh, some kind of, you know, experiences. Targeting country which has similar endowment structure and their per capita GDP is about, you know, 100% higher than yours, yours and they're growing dynamically. And in general, for a developing country, their industrial policy try to target, you know, industries in countries their per capita GDP was five times, sometimes 10 times higher than yours. And, and, and that is some kind of reason you uh, miss target industry which you do not have comparative advantage. And why you should target industry which that their per capita GDP is about 100% higher than yours and they are growing dynamically and they have similar endowment structure. Because country has similar endowment structure, they should have similar competitive advantages. And if a country can grow in dynamically for an extended period of time, that means most of the industry in the country should be consistent with their com competitive advantages. But if they're growing dynamically for an extended period of time, the capital will have accumulated. The mature industry in those kind of tradable industry in those kind of country will lose competitive advantages. And if they lose competitive advantages, then they, those kind of will be your sunrise industry. So that's the concept behind this kind of targeting. And for this, I develop a process called gross identification and facilitation. The first one, find fast growing country with similar endowment structure and their particular GDP is about 100% higher than yours. Or 20 years ago, they had a similar particular GDP and identify dynamically growing mature tradable industry in that kind of country. And those kind of industry are likely to be your latent competitive advantages. And this is important. It can you know, prevent the government to do wrong things or the government to be captured by West interest group for forensic. And then after you have some list of you know, potential industries, then you can come back home to see why there are some domestic firm already entering into those kind of industries. And then if they enter, that means they have some kind of, you know, uh, uh, tacit knowledge there already. But this currently, they are still in the early stage. And how come you should have latent compare advantage in this sector that they cannot compete with your, you know, industry in your target industry country? Most likely because of high transaction costs. Then the government should identify 
what are the mining constraints to close in the high transaction cost? And uh, this approach, this state, incorporate the ideas of task technology you know, advocated by Ricardo Hosman. And then some industry may be totally new to you, but there should be your latent compared advantages. And under this kind of situation, you should have an active investment promotion to invite a firm in your reference country to relocate their production to yours because they are losing comparative advantage in their country. And they should have some incentive to relocate their production to you know, a country with similar endowment structure, but which rate is much lower. But if the foreign direct investment would not come, then you need to understand why they would not come. They may not know your country or well, because of you know, infrastructure institutions are not attractive enough, then we should improve that. Certainly, you can also organize some kind of incubation program to support domestic firms to enter that. And this means that touch knowledge is important, but actually touch knowledge can be imported or cultivated. Then, in addition to industry identity in step one, you know, every country has some kind of unique endowments, and they may have some kind of industry which, you know, they can enter and produce, and their product will be demand domestically and internationally. And not only so, <clears throat> there are some new technology that develop in the last 20 years and so on. So your reference country, they did not have those kind of industries. But if you have some domestic firm already identified those kind of opportunities that enters and ensure the profitability, then the government should also help them to scale up by removing the binding country in infrastructure. One good example is the information service industry in India in the 1980s. Before 1980s, there was no information service industries. But India firm identified that opportunity. At the beginning, they used the satellite telecommunication to provide information service for firm in the US. Certainly, that kind of satellite you know, transmission is what's very costly. Then by improving the land-based telecommunication, reduce transaction costs. And you know that India now is the, you know, most competitive country in information services. So that is, you know, to benefit from opportunity arising from new technology for our country's unique endowments. <clears throat> and in a developing country, in general, high and soil infrastructures are poor. And, uh, but resources in the country is limited and how to improve the hard and soft infrastructure to reduce transaction costs. Then the country can use some kind of very pragmatic way. That is to set up special economic zone or industrial park, and within a zone or park, make the infrastructure good enough, institution good enough, and to reduce transaction costs. And I can also to use this as a way to you know, encourage foreign direct investment or to encourage the formation of clusters and that can also further reduce transaction costs. So this is a, you know, a pragmatic way for the government to play the cotization law. And lastly, the government should provide some incentive to compensate for the first mover's externality by some tax incentive. And if you have a financial repression, you can provide some you know, access to credit. Or if you have foreign exchange control, you can also you know, provide some kind of priority in the access to foreign exchanges. And this can be some kind of incentive for the first movers. And here I'd like to mention, this incentive should be small and limited and will be enough because what you try to compensate is externality instead of the viability that often used you know, in the import substitution strategy. The import substitution strategy, the industry that you try to develop are not consistent with your comparative advantages. They are not viable. And the subsidy and protection needed to be very large and for, you know, almost forever. But for this kind of industry are consistent with your latent comparative advantages. What you want to compensate is just externality generated by first movers. And uh, for some kind of industry, you already are on the global frontier. You are already the leading age industry in the world. 
what kind of industrial policy that the government should use. Because if the industry are already on the global technological frontier, like my own country, the household appliances, like color TV refrigerator, China is already a global leader. And if they want to maintain leadership in those kind of industries, certainly the firm would have to do R research and a D to develop new product, new technology. But we know that the firm would have incentive to do D because they can get patents, but they are not interested in doing R, basic research. However, without basic research, then the potential to do D is very limited. So under the kind of situation, the government should invest in the basic research in the university or in the institution and to work with the private firm to support their technology development. In fact, high-income countries are doing this all the time because high-income countries, their industries are on the global technological frontier. And in high-income countries, the government support basic research and that facilitate technology you know, innovation in their leading edge industries. The government can also use a procurement to support the new product, new technology, to enable them to reach economic scale in production quickly. The government can also support from penetration to you know, new market. And you can see the high income country in general, they do that all the time. When they are present with a new a country, they will bring you know, hundreds of you know, firm to come with him and the purpose is to enter the country. And a middle income country, if they have those kind of leading edge industry, the government can also do the similar things. Then there are some industries that may already lose comparative advantages. For example, very labor intensive industries and wage is the most important cost in those kind of industries, like a garment shoes and so on. And uh, if you reach high middle income, which will be too high, and this industry will lose competitive advantages. And under this kind of situation, some firms may move up to the so-called two ends of the smart curve, branding, product design, marketing. And at the low end of the smart curve, that is the processing, they have to relocate to country with low wage cost. For example, in my country, that labor intensive industry, like a shoe, the garment, and so on, a garment, now apparel. China used to be the global factory for that. But now, per the GDP in China reach more than 10,000 US dollars. China lose the competitive advantage in those kind of industry. So some firm may move up to the branding and uh, you know, product design or marketing. But the production part, China is losing competitive advantages, and China will have to relocate those kind of industry to other country or open up the market space for other country to enter the industries. And one potential certainly is for Indonesia to take advantages of that and enter into that. And for my country, if those kind of industry locate, their production relocate to other country, then the government should provide training to the workers so, that, so they can move to other industries. And then the industries for leapfrogging in short innovation cycle. And now uh, in the fourth industrial revolution, and especially in the information age, there are some kind of industry, their technology or their products. Innovation cycle is so short. Sometimes 12 months, at the most 18 months, they have a new cycles. And uh, for this kind of industries, the most important inputs are human capitals. In a middle-income country, especially a large middle-income country like China or Indonesia, we have many talented people. And so there's a potential for this large middle-income country to utilize its advantage in human capital and to participate in the competition of innovation in those kind of industries. And uh, so the government certainly also need to give some support to those kind of talented people, you can set up incubation park, encourage venture capitals, and certainly you need to protect intellectual property rights. And uh, 
the government can also use a procurement to support, especially if it's a hardware you know, products. And uh, lastly, every country may have some kind of strate strategic energy, especially related to the national defense. They are so capital intensive and their duration of innovation is so long, sometimes 20, 30 years. And the country do not have does not have comparative advantage in those kind of industry, but they are essential for your national security or economic security. For this kind of industry, the government would have to subsidize the firm, just like the import substitution strategies. And, but the subsidy should come directly from the fiscal appropriation instead of you know, market protection by price uh, 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 distortion or by market mon monopoly. The government should use fiscal and appropriation like in a high income country, allowing all the time. And uh, by this way, you can have this kind of strategic industry, but you are not really stole the market. So far, I only talk about the technological innovation and industrial upgrading in the manufacturing sector. Certainly, manufacturing sector are the most important sectors for you to you know, move from low income to middle income to high income. Uh, unless you are oil rich country, unless you are, you know, extremely abundant in the an uh, arable land, otherwise you cannot become a high income country without manufacturing. And so that's the reason why I talk a lot about the structural transformation in the manufacturing sectors. But for a middle income country or a low income country, they also need to pay attention to the agricultural development because agriculture so far may still provide the majority of employment. And for agriculture, you certainly also need to have a structural transformation by technological innovation in the existing you know, crops and also need to move from the crop from staple crop to cash crop and so on. And for those kind of changes, certainly you also need to have a state to support that. Then for a resources abundant country, you know, like Indonesia, relatively speaking, you are also a resources abundant country. And the resources can be a curse, but it can be a, you know, it can be abrasion. And to avoid the curse, to turn that operation the first, we know that the prices of resources are fluctuating in the international markets. So you need to have a management. When the price is high, you should you know, keep the majority of that revenue. And uh, so you can smooth the spending. Instead of the prices are high, you have a lot of income, you spend all the money. And then the, the prices drops, you are caught. So you need to have some kind of management system like Chile is using. You know, they only spend about 10% of the revenues from their you know, copper mining each year. And I see about 90% of that. And to weather through the fluctuation and also because resources can be depleted. And so you should save some money for the future generation, that's one thing. And secondly, a resources abundant country not only save the money, they should use, use part of the money to facilitate the structural transformation from the resources intensive industry to manufacturing industry by improving infrastructure, education, and so on. And if they can do that, then a resources abundant country like Indonesia should be able to do, you know, the structural transformation much faster than a resources poor country. You know, fundamentally, U.S. is a resource abundant country, but U.S. can become a high income country, I think only because the U.S. government uses the resources revenue to, you know, facilitate the structural transformation. For example, like set up the highway system by set up the land grant university in the U.S. So that's something, you know, Indonesia can also learn some experiences. So what is the implication for Indonesia? From my analysis, the middle income is not a middle income trap is not a destiny for a middle income country. And it's certainly not a destiny 
for Indonesia. If the Indonesian government and use an effective industrial policy to play a facilitation role, facilitating role to enable technological innovation and industrial grading according to Indonesia's competitive advantages in a market economy and turns resources from a curse to abrasion, Indonesia should be able to maintain 7% or more growth rate annually for 20 years or more. You know, in 1967 to 1997, Indonesia was able to maintain 6.8% growth rate for 30 years. At the time, Indonesia followed infrastructure strategies. If Indonesia turned from the strategy as I described, I think Indonesia should be able to maintain 7% or more growth rate for 20 years or 30 years or even more. And in, 19, in 2019, Indonesia's GNI per capita was 4,050 US dollars. And Indonesia, if Indonesia can grow at 7% or even more, Indonesia will cross the threshold of 12,535 US dollars. That is a threshold for high income countries. And once you cross this red hole, then Indonesia will become a high income country within 20 years. I think potential is there. And the crucial thing that you need to have, you know, a right strategy guided by right ideas. And if you are interested in my ideas, I have a few books, The Structural Economics, The Quest for Prosperity, The Between the Arts, The Oxford Handbook or Industrial Hubs, and economic development, and also economic development and transition and industrial policy revolution. So maybe you can refer to that uh, to know more details about what I present in this talk, in this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lane. That's a great introduction to the new structural economics framework and it ended with a very positive message for Indonesia. So now we'll invite the first uh, discussion, Dr. Pranawan. And uh, Dr. Pranawan, please discuss for 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Let me uh, start the presentation as a discussion for Professor Justin the legend of the economist which is which was previously uh, the economist of the world bank and also he constructed the uh, previous development of the economy in china uh, the presentation is very what is that interesting and i would like to what is that started with the adam smith Okay, the Wealth of Nation, which is published in uh, March 1776 uh, during Scottish Enlightenment and uh, Agricultural Revolution at that time is uh, influencing several authors uh, such as Karl Marx, as well as the government and organization and many debates in terms of economics uh, and also discussion after, uh, long after he died. Also, Alexander Hamilton was influenced uh, by him and also the wealth of nation, uh, something like inspire, including Professor Justin up, up to now. And also followed by many uh, uh, traditionalists of, such as Dr. Ricardo and many others, which uh, uh, finally, uh, what is that, uh, creating some ideas about the competitive advantage and also uh, how the country may gain from trade and also can advance in the economy by the inspiration of the wealth of nation. And I agree with the, uh, what is it, the presentation of uh, Professor Justin, which uh, uh, value the market as well, and also creating the, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, advancement of the industrialization, but 
Also, the services sector in Indonesia is very important, Professor Justin, because uh, we have plenty of uh, 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 what is that industrialization and in services sectors, and it is stopped by uh, what we call it the uh, the pandemic now. And I I would like to start the uh, what is it, the latest situation now. Please next uh, next page, please. I think it is because of uh, what is that the influenza makes the growth of the countries, including Indonesia, is just fall from the uh, very optimistic. But now we see the uh, what is that the uh, negative uh, economic growth is uh, minus five point uh, thirty two, and then now is getting higher to be minus. Uh, 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 uh. 3.5, if I'm speaking, the latest one from uh, Statistic Indonesia. And hopefully, uh, at the end of the uh, quarter, we will have a zero economic growth and started to be positive in 2021. Middle income trap is something related to the uh, uh, economic growth as well as the uh, uh, the GDP per capita. And by uh, learning what is the experience in since 1918, uh, 1917 until uh, now, the pandemic, the influenza is very important factors that can uh, have a different direction of the uh, per capita income as well as the economic growth from 19. Uh, 17, United States, let's say, enter World War One, and then 1918, there is uh, influenza, the Spanish flu, until 1920, it's about 27 months, and it reduced the economic growth at the time, and also the per capita GDP of the United States and all over the world uh, uh, diminishing. And actually, at that time, there is a very good lesson that we can learn because of uh, 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 coping with the uh, recession at the time. Although it is only a short-run recession, that's why it is called a forgotten recession, may inspire us how to uh, take the action, the policy, especially the industrialization policy and also the services sector policy in order to uh, recover uh, and then uh, uh, have an uh, increasing uh, uh, level of the economy after that one. Because at the time, after uh, the Spanish influenza at the time, we have uh, learned the economic growth in many countries in the world at the time. The death rate at the time is very high. And the people who died at the time is almost uh, 100 million, according to some uh, historian. Then uh, the pandemic now, although it is very uh, influential to many countries' economy, but it is com uh, it's not comparable to uh, 1918's uh, the pandemic, Spanish pandemic. And we learned that uh, since 1920s until 1929, that the uh, economy of uh, United States and Europe are increasing very rapidly at the level of 10 until 12 percent economic growth. Then there is a very uh, good lesson we can learn on uh, how to recover the economy and finally to uh, uh, stabilize the economy at a very high or uh, 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 economic growth or very high pace level. And uh, the influenza is going on and on is to end to history and and to and there will be I think uh, later on. Uh, another uh, pandemic, which is uh, 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 with the sources of influenza. Next, please. This is the latest uh, data. Next. The three uh, major economy, uh, uh, one slide before. The three major economy is the uh, United States of America, India, and Brazil. And Indonesia is about uh, number 20 or 21 or something. Uh, United States case is one uh, 10 million uh, 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 
case and then the death is 242,000. India is 8.7. Brazil is 5.75. The economy is diminishing. Uh, next, please. And this is the performance of the countries uh, beating the COVID, which is influential to uh, what is the uh, GDP per capita, which is uh, related directly to the MIT. And this is the Indonesian total case, which is 552,000. And uh, new cases every day is about uh, 4,000. And the highest level is 4,800. And the latest data is 3,770 with the uh, uh, people uh, pass away 14,000. And the world total is 52 uh, million. It is the uh, total case. The new case is about 500,000 and the death is 1.2 uh, million. Next, please. This is the comparison between the, uh, the achiever of the uh, pandemic with Indonesia as well as uh, uh, the second achiever, meaning the negative achiever of the uh, COVID. <clears throat> uh, the GDP between uh, Indonesia and uh, uh, United States of America uh, growth rate is uh, very different. Indonesia has minus 5.32, while United States of America is minus 9. And per capita GDP is all, uh, is, uh, can fall in the United States of America. Now, Indonesia is about uh, 4,600, while the United States of America is 56,000. Uh, Compared to India, the growth rate of uh, India at the lowest rate is minus 23%, while Indonesia is minus 5.32%. And per capita GDP of Indonesia compared to uh, India, uh, Indonesia is two times higher is 4,600, uh, 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 4, while India is 2,200. And we can make a, a, what's that, a visualization of what it look like of Indonesia and in India and the United States later. Okay, next please. Okay, this is MIT and uh, already mentioned by Professor Justin that it is usually referred to uh, the countries that have experienced uh, rapid growth, but quickly slow down once uh, the countries reach a middle income level, but then fail to overcome that income range to further catch up the developed countries. Some economists mention that the uh, MIT happens because of a country sells more and gets richer and it pays higher wages then increases the cost of selling the stuff, so lose their competitive advantage and can uh, get stuck and unable to sell more and get richer. Then there is uh, something like a, a middle income trap for many countries. It is then constructive to examine Indonesia as it part of the emerging economy that has most notably defied MIT tendency. While only 13 developing countries avoided the middle income trap since 1960s, five of them were in East Asia. Next, please. And this is some of the literature, uh, 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 two of them from uh, Barry H. And Green. Uh, he mentioned with the friends of also a larger group of countries as at risk of the growth slowdown and that middle income countries may find themselves slowing down at lower income level than implied by uh, earlier estimate of uh, 2011. And then also find that slowdown are less likely in countries where the population has a relatively high level of secondary and tertiary education and where high technology products account for relatively large share of export consistent with the uh, earlier uh, study, which is emphasizing on the importance of moving up the technology ladder in order to avoid the middle income trap. Then the technology as part of the economic growth and uh, to increase the per capita GDP is very important to avoid the uh, middle income trap. 
Okay, another uh, study next by the same author with the uh, friends. This is a very important uh, findings. As per capita income reach 16,500 per year in terms of purchasing power parity, the economic growth rate on average fall from 5.6% to only 2.1%. It is because of the uh, uh, factors that I mentioned before in the previous screen. And then especially for countries with aging population and low uh, real exchange rate, they tend to uh, have a tendency to the uh, uh, trap, to the middle income trap. This is uh, by uh, Barry Agent Green in 2011 uh, paper. Okay, next please. And this is the uh, sum of the uh, uh, countries, which is uh, according to uh, Professor Justin, is leap frogging, uh, jumping out from the crowd, something like uh, uh, in 1960s it is Japan, in 1980s it is uh, 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 South Korea. We know that the uh, uh, Japanese economy in 19. Uh, uh, 60s is uh, has a very rapid pace of economic growth at that time after uh, the uh, uh, what is that the post-war economic uh, miracle I, I, I mentioned by guidance of uh, Ministry of uh, Economy Trade and Industry at the time uh, the economic growth of Japanese economy is about 10% uh, in 1960s and 5% is 1970s and slowing down. Japan was able to establish and maintain itself as the world's second largest economy uh, since 1978 until 2010 when it was surpassed by uh, China. Uh, by 1990s, uh, income per capita of Japan equal to uh, equal or surpass that uh, in most countries in, in the West. And also during the second uh, half of the 1980s, uh, Japan rise stock and real estate prices created uh, at the time the economic bubble. While uh, another one, which is South Korea, is jumping out from the crowd in uh, 1980s, it is uh, actually started by, uh, in 1980s, there is a, a, a coup of General Park Chung-hee at the time, a protectionist economic policy began and then pushing uh, uh, South Korea, it is uh, uh, something like uh, reactivated the internal market. Then in, in order to promote at the time, the development of the economy, the policy of industrialization by import substitution was applied, closing uh, the entry into the country of all kinds of foreign products except the materials, nor did the resort uh, to foreign investment at that time. And then there is a, a agricultural reform uh, with the expropriation without the compensation of Japanese uh, large estate, and then General Park nationalized the financial system to swell the powerful state arm. But after that, there is a invention of the, what we call it a semiconductor at that time. It is something like a, a main parts of the uh, uh, industrialization by the uh, conglomerates at the time, something like now uh, there is an increasing uh, what is that? The economy of South Korea because of Hyundai, Samsung, and then LG Corporation, and many uh, automotive industry as well in South Korea because of the uh, invention of semiconductor at the time. Well, we're running out of time, Bak. Would you mind uh, going to the questions for Professor Lin? Okay, uh, let me uh, finish Indonesia for uh, three minutes. Next, Thank please. Thank you. For Indonesia, for the next, next page, please. This Indonesia GDP was the words about, uh, 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 with, this is with uh, uh, more than one trillion. And then next, next please. And then this is the per capita GDP of Indonesia is more than 4,000. 
and this is very very good started uh, 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 I think and it can be developed uh, later with the uh, uh, information technology and also the advanced technology that we have the resources but we have no massive resources in the human uh, uh, human capital next please the last page yes this one please stop this one then the plausible hypothesis why uh, Indonesia is has a tendency of the uh, what is that the uh, middle income trap because of many factors something like wage rise labor mi migration demographic uh, uh, slowness and then shallow financial market low level of innovation health education and leadership but it is uh, something like uh, the start must be coming from the industrial sectors the role of na national leadership uh, i think is in the case of uh, uh, what is that the uh, the national level uh, leadership and also the local level leadership is very crucial in formulating and strengthening the effective uh, industrial policy and also synchronizing confirmability of the policy of the national policy and also the local policy must be met uh, must be confirmed and then also the country needs to improve uh, human capital <coughs> i have the idea that the uh, uh, what is it the middle income trap can be avoided if we have the uh, what is it the, the projection of the innovative economy based on the technological industry as well as the small scale industry in, uh, to back up the innovation industry but the industry itself which is more technological more techy has to be uh, what is that uh, backed up by the stability of the economy and also the stability of the politics the stability of the economy and the stability of politics has the fundamentals of the human resources the quality quality of the human resources with the very massive number of something like the uh, uh, engineers and then doctors and then lawyers we still don't have that we are in progressing in what is that uh, 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 creating some uh, numbers uh, uh, massive number of lawyers massive numbers of economists massive number of engineers massive numbers of uh, high skillful uh, uh, human resources but now we are still in the middle of uh, uh, middle and low skill uh, skill uh, labor which uh, create a lower value that's why it is very important for the country to reduce the wealth gap whereas uh, the human capital and social harmonization are vital prerequisite for successful industrial policy and also the school enrollment ratio for the higher education must be increased to link and match the needs of the, uh, the modern industry with create some uh, higher of a uh, 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 leapfrogging uh, value added as well as the performance of manufacturing sectors need to be improved significantly by focusing at the needs of the domestic as well as international market then we have uh, the start of the international need and also the domestic need and by this uh, focusing industry and also the service industry we can go the uh, middle income trap as well as accelerating higher implementable technology for the country is a must for the pre prerequisite to uh, jump out from the crowd to leapfrog the economy and jump out from the uh, 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 business as usual uh, five percent or less than five percent economic growth in order to achieve the higher level of per capita income GDP that's why since Indonesia uh, economic performance is highly influenced by external shock so Indonesia has to produce uh, the goods <coughs> and services which is uh, what is that uh, supported by uh, the government it is uh, something like vital for Indonesia to support the uh, 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 the uh, private sectors as well as the uh, 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 what is that the uh, uh, state on in prices and finally the last one is the financial market has to be very uh, uh, deep penetrate to the uh, economy to serve the real sectors much more this need uh, Indonesia needs this one to uh, what is that to develop the uh, financial market carefully 
because some uh, of the uh, financial market doesn't link to the real sectors. That's why this is very important for uh, improving uh, the economy of Indonesia in order to jump out from the middle income trap. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pranawan. Thank you. Uh, now let's invite Dr. Bariko from the University of Indonesia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for your kind introductions. Uh, thank you, Professor Justin Lin, for your uh, very interesting uh, and thought-provoking one uh, presentation. Uh, please allow me to share my screen. Yep. Okay, I'm going to use this 10 minutes as effective as I can. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I have four points uh, to be delivered uh, as a comments or questions to Professor Justin Lee. And uh, please allow me to give a brief uh, uh, facts data uh, before I pass my questions and comments. Uh, let me start with the first uh, page. Uh, you mentioned in your paper in the beginning that Indonesia uh, has been in a trap, a middle income trap for 50 years since late 1960. And also you refer to the Agenor et al. Uh, to published in 2012 that Indonesia uh, been trapped for uh, 50 years as well. Uh, to me, the most important thing is to think about that Indonesia is in the upper middle le level now, uh, just early this year, mid of this year, uh, with 4,000 US dollar per capita. And this is the longest uh, length, and if you use this as a proxy of time, this is the longest time, probably. So uh, we need more effort to graduate from the upper middle, upper middle level to high income level. And uh, we are facing also a bonus demographic that will end uh, before uh, 2040. Then our time is only 20 years. If we trap in lower middle like 50 years, then how can we afford to uh, escape from this time? It's only limited for 20 years. So uh, to me, this is more important. Many countries uh, uh, stay in upper middle without uh, achieving the high income level. Number two, you mentioned about uh, Japan and Korea, also Malaysia and Thailand, also uh, Singapore. They graduated from upper middle level, uh, some like Japan and Korea. And I put, I try to put the figures here. And we can see that both countries using the manufacturing sector as a role uh, engine of economic growth can book economic growth above 10% for several years with inflation rate uh, stable, lower than uh, economic growth, double digit, like what we also uh, witnessed uh, in China economic growth uh, since uh, 2000s. And this is with the role of uh, manufacturing sectors. And uh, Japan graduated in 1970s and Korea 1990s. A very interesting uh, facts, by the way. And I tried to uh, calculate my own Indonesian data uh, starting 2017. Uh, let's say uh, in the next uh, 15 or 20 years, uh, the level of high income is 13,000. And how we graduate that uh, and how much uh, economic growth that uh, we need to graduate. And I try to replicate the model, actually, the numbers uh, coming from the Papanas. And I try to uh, replicate with uh, my cal own calculation. And I found uh, it's about 6.6% uh, at the very minimum uh, to achieve economic growth until 2040. And it's not easy. Uh, and I know you explain much more on this issue, uh, how to get it. And I'm interested also for your in your paper, you mentioned about smiling curve, Professor Justin, and I think this is very interesting. Uh, and I try to uh, how to get to figure out this from the set face to smiling face. And that's mean economic transformations. You explain uh, much on uh, how to uh, graduate it uh, with the type, five type of industry. I will touch four of them. Uh, why I'm not touch. Uh, the, the, uh, the the last but the least uh, subject industry, I will explain in the, in, in the last uh, of my presentations. But I would like to ask here is how do we mitigate the impact, short run impact uh, for, uh, for like uh, income gap, uh, open unemployment or structural unemployment uh, or uh, poverty or rural urban migration because of the transformations. 
So again, the question is two. Number one, is it manufacturing that most is essential for Indonesia to escape the uh, middle income trap, uh, especially before 2040, before the end of uh, demographic bonus? And how do we mitigate the temporary impacts of the economic transformations uh, on what I mentioned before? And then type three, I want uh, to touch the type three industry that you mentioned, comparative advantage losing industries. And I try to calculate uh, top 15 Indonesian export, uh, the, the latest data, uh, and then top 15 import the latest data uh, with the RCA, CMSA in terms of trade and net export. And I, yeah, this confirm uh, what also uh, what you also mentioned that Indonesia uh, export uh, comparative advantage more on labor intensive and natural resources. And based on uh, trade in value added data of the OECD, we found that Indonesia forward linkage is higher than backward linkage. That's confirmed again, uh, we depends on labor intensive and uh, raw materials, uh, primary products. But I also see from the upper middle le manufacturing firm level survey uh, that majority Indonesia uh, manufacturing sectors are uh, 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 working on uh, food and beverage. 25% of it, majority. And then uh, our import related to food related products. However, the latest data, uh, sorry, however, the latest data uh, in, uh, how to call it, uh, BPS uh, just released last week. Uh, during the pandemic, we the, the sectors that re, uh, resilience and agility in Indonesia, both food and beverage and food related products. So this is something like maybe uh, maybe like a first mover uh, advantage potential for Indonesia comparative advantage. Then my question is, uh, do we need to focus on labor intensive manufacturing and primary sector export? Or we move with agriculture, uh, agri, agro industry as a first mover advantage as you mentioned in your paper, as a first mover? Or uh, we don't need to think about the sector, let the, sec let the, let the sectors, let the markets uh, find its sectors. Uh, uh, we just focus on the method, avoid picking the winner, avoid import substitution strategies, uh, and then uh, using, uh, as you mentioned, your paper, not neoliberalism, but uh, or Washington consensus, but on the dual, uh, dual track of uh, approach, uh, or we combine this all together. If, if there's a how, uh, I think you mentioned in your paper, but uh, it's, it, this will be more, more uh, uh, narrowing on this uh, point of view. Then for type one and type two, type one is uh, catching up industry, type two, uh, leading edge industries. Uh, this related much related to human capital. Uh, let me show you uh, human capital level in Indonesia. 58% of our employments hold degree uh, primary school below. And average years of school, Indonesia is eight years. So not graduated even from uh, primary school majority. And then uh, from the formal and informal activities, 57% uh, informal uh, activities. And then from the data of uh, uh, R&D per GDP, Indonesia is one of the lowest uh, percentage in the world. And then from the manufacturing uh, uh, level uh, survey, uh, we also find that uh, our uh, utilizations of R&D and in innovation in our manufacturing sectors is quite low. 7% for R&D and 13% for innovation. And this is from uh, based on uh, LPM uh, research 2011, that the availability of the engineer in Indonesia is uh, more, more than 50% uh, at the level of supervision, plant supervision, production supervision. Uh, is, uh, the more we move to the more uh, skillful uh, engineer like R&D or uh, technical design, uh, the lowest uh, percentage we have. Uh, so we are still at the level of, uh, again, uh, more than assembly and modern supervision. Uh, so given the Netherlands and British that you mentioned in your paper back then, uh, 16th and 17th century, I found a uh, saving investment gap like a chicken and egg problem. So my question is, uh, which one first? Improving human capital, then we ask uh, for uh, investment coming uh, for a production network, not for market seeking or natural resource seeking, or we attract investment coming, and then we ask the investor to improve our human capital, like uh, giving incentive and so on. And this is uh, uh, because uh, investment and human capital have uh, uh, 
uh, like endogenous uh, relations. Last but not least about digital economy, uh, I think you mentioned in your paper, I read one, but uh, not really uh, deep on this issue. So I would like to ask you, uh, to give you uh, the perspective first. With the platform of economy, uh, in Indonesia economy 50% uh, centered in uh, the west of Indonesia, and then 30% in the center of Indonesia, and 10% to 15% in the east part, eastern part of Indonesia. Then with the platform, digital platform, they can, you know, uh, free flows of uh, sending their products and buying the intermediate input uh, within uh, the regions. So the flows you can see here, uh, they can freely uh, flows uh, of goods, both final, final uh, products and intermediate products. And then from the production side, uh, with the blockchain and then uh, in connection, uh, connected with the urban farming, uh, phenomenon in Indonesia with the help of the digital economy, uh, they can use Internet of Things to modernizing a farm at, uh, uh, in urban using Internet Internet of Things to optimize the pro uh, production process, uh, even control the uh, the production side and then trade and also uh, fair pricing uh, controlled by the blockchain. So. Uh, this is touching the issue of short innovation cycle, as you mentioned, that a developing country has a has possibility to uh, overtake developed country in the short innovation cycle. And I think this is related to that. And uh, then my question is, how do you see the role of digital economy in Indonesia economic transformation? And uh, in relation to that, uh, what are the government roles in this matter? So uh, this is uh, uh, all my questions. And, and then, uh, as I promise, uh, why I don't touch the type five strategic industries, because I think given Indonesia experience 1970s, 1990s, uh, it's not much related to the economic growth. So given that our aim to graduate, uh, let's say from upper middle income level to high income level, uh, escape from this trap uh, is about uh, boosting economic growth. So strategic industry to me uh, uh, is a bit costly and we, we better uh, talking about uh, more on the market side uh, issues. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Raiko. It's very insightful. So, Professor Ling, uh, do you want to briefly uh, respond? I think both of them mentioned the uh, very low level of human capital. So, that's, I think, one issue. And also, uh, which sector should we uh, promote or say labor intensive versus agro? Uh, agriculture, or we just don't concentrate on any sector like the market design. And the last one that I mentioned by Dr. Ray called the digital economy. Thank you. Okay, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, I'm not an expert on Indonesian economy. And so I'm not really in a position to provide good policy advices. And I said, my presentation is more inspirational to show there may be a way, there's a possibility for a country to sustain dynamic economic growth for an extended period of time and to move from low income to middle income to high income. And that's the purpose of my presentations. And so let me just say, it, I learned a lot from hearing to the two presentation and uh, to get a much better understanding of Indonesian economics. And I think that I need to do more in order to have a good answer to all the questions. But since now we are on the discussion more, so let me be brief. The first one regarding Professor Konawa, at the end, you mentioned a list of you know, essential improvements that would be desirable for middle-income countries, uh, for Indonesia to move from middle-income to high-income. And I have to acknowledge all those things are certainly very important. But if you look into the past, and a developing country often receive those kind of lists from international development institutions, five items, 10 items, 20 items, 30 items, and if you look at it, items seem to be so desirable. But the issue is that even you try very hard to improve all those items, you still cannot move from 
low income to middle income, or middle income to high income. Then they all come back to give you another list to say you need to improve this and that. And you try very hard again, you still not move. And then you never come back again. You have another list. I discuss that kind of phenomena in our book called Between the Arts. There are so many examples. So for me, certainly they are all available. But maybe we need to a more pragmatic ways to look at what we have now. Based on what we have, what we can do well. And then what are the bottleneck to scale up those kind of things that you can do well. And only look into all those kind of in the bottlenecks, mining countries, in those kind of sectors, which you can potentially do well. And that's the five type of industry framework I try to promote. And by that, you know, by a very pragmatic way, even you did not improve everything of that, you can still move up the income ladies. For example, if I look into your eight items, China did not improve all of them. And for example, in 2010, the per capita GDP in China was 4,300, very similar to Indonesia now. And I have to admit, China did not improve all those kind of eight items. We have aging population. We have very shallow financial markets and so on. But currently, China's progressive GDP already reached 10,000 last year. And this year, like to be 11,000. So I think those kind of more pragmatic way may be desirable. And that's just one in a recommendation. <clears throat> and the uh, second one coming to Professor, uh, uh, Professor uh, Vrico. Your question, your first question is that you have the income gap, you have the employment issue, you have a little urban gap and so on. What would be the best way to do, deal with those kind of challenges? And my ideas might be to develop industries, which you have competitive advantages. And certainly at this stage, Indonesia has competitive advantages in some resources intensive industries. Indonesia also have competitive advantages in tourist industry because you have many attractions. But at the same time, Indonesia has such an abundant supply of young labor force. And uh, certainly you also have competitive advantages in the labor intensive manufacturing industries. And if you can develop labor intensive manufacturing industries, they can provide you know, abundant jobs, and they can attract migration from the rural area to the urban manufacturing sectors. And certainly, they can allow the low income keeper to be employed and to benefit from the growth. And by this way, the issue of the income gap, employment, rural urban gap can be mitigated. And that is the you know, new structural economics try to advocate. Always look into what you can do based on what you have. That is your latent compare advantages. And then create a condition to remove the bottleneck in those kind of areas. Certainly, Indonesia has latent compare advantages in agricultural resources. And we need to look into what are the bottlenecks, bottlenecks to further develop that. And so you also need to develop agriculture. But at the same time, we have so many labor force. And certainly, you know, manufacturing in labor intensive sectors, you can also develop them. And as you do remove the bottleneck of that. And then, you know, regarding the, you know, the, 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 the picking the winners, you know, the market certainly can provide the price signal which sectors that you have compound advantages but the market cannot play the function of coordination in the improvement of needed education, in the improvement of infrastructure. So at the end, if you rely, only rely on the markets to you know, develop your economies and hope then can promote you know, structural transformation, 
you can find always the structures of information has been so slow. And that is what Danny Logic identified the industrialization in so many developing countries. Now, before the, the, the structure adjustment, many developing countries with the support of import substitution industries, and certainly with that, the government had all kinds of intervention distortions. And a structural adjustment advised the government to remove those kind of distortions. As a result, the priority sectors in the foreign industry decline or collapse. But at the same time, the structural adjustment always advised the government to rely on market spontaneous forces for the industrial development. But in many cases, we did not see new industry to emerge in the developing country. All industry declined, new industry would not emerge, you know, by this market spontaneous forces. And as a result, we see the deindustrialization. And that's the reason why we need to have a facilitating state in a market economy to overcome the externality issue for the first movers. But at the end time, to provide the necessary improvement, the infrastructural institution to allow the sector which you have competitive advantages to become competitive advantage in your economy quickly. And by that, and as I said, without a facilitation state to target sectors, market cannot do that. And regarding the chicken and egg issue, I think it's not chicken and no. eggs. You need to no. do that no. simultaneously. You need to identify the sector which you want to develop. And you need to understand what are the bottlenecks of that. And then help to remove the bottleneck simultaneously. And you can do that, you know, in a pragmatic, 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 uh, in a pragmatic way. For example, if you want to develop certain kind of labor intensive manufacturing, you have very poor education poor infrastructure, poor business environment. Certainly, the standard recommendation is that improve education, improve the business environment, improve the infrastructure for the whole nations. Then everything will happen spontaneously. There are two limitations. How much resources and how much time you need to improve all the education, all the infrastructure, all the business environment for the whole nations. You can never wait. So by that, you can set up industrial parks, and uh, depends on what kind of industry you want to develop, you set up the infrastructure and business environment in the industrial park or special economic zone. And you also understand what kind of human capital you need, will be needed. And I provide some kind of vocational education. But in fact, I never, you know, I did not go to Indonesia for now maybe 15 years. I don't know exactly the situation, but I'm sure if you develop industrial park, in let's say five places in Indonesia, you have sufficient human capital, all kind of skill, all kind of labor force for those kind of industrial park or special economic zone. So you don't need to wait. So it's not a chicken and egg. It's a coordination issue. Then platform certainly it's a new technology that can transform the all industries. And uh, you know we have a new business type. Indonesia should catch up. Should you know grasp that opportunity. And uh, you know, Indonesia is a large country, certainly platform economy, Indonesia can have some competitive advantages. And Indonesia, from what I see, should not you know, allow this opportunity to slip away. So that's my short uh, response. And if I say something nonsense, please you know, forgive me because I'm not an expert of Indonesia. Thank you, thank you, Professor Ling. So uh, we'll open the floor for general questions because uh, we don't have much time. So we'll take three questions uh, each time. And please limit your qu question pretty short and only one question per person. So the first round of question is from Ross McDonald, uh, McLeod, Dimas Muhammad, and Desai Peng. So Ross, uh, can you start, please? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Sarah. You caught me on the hop there. I wasn't really expecting that. Um, I've got I've got lots and lots of questions, and I've already submitted uh, several of these uh, in the form of comments, which you can uh, read, I guess, in the I'm not sure if it's the Q and A or the chat screen. 
Um, but I guess my my bottom line on on Justin's whole paper is that um, it's it seems to me that this so-called new structural economics is, is just like old wine in new bottles. It seems to me that you borrow from structural views and neoliberal views, both of which you don't seem to like or you, you both, or you think both have been failures. And yet, you know, just like the structuralists, you're in favour of governments picking winners and losers. And just like the neoliberals, you're in favour of uh, competitive markets. I don't think any sensible neoliberal economist is going to disagree that governments have a role to play in providing um, public goods and dealing with externalities and so on. So, I frankly, I don't see that um, this so-called new structural economics is actually offering anything new. It just seems like uh, old wine in new bottles to me. So, um, let me leave it there. Okay. Uh, second, Dimas. Okay, Dimas. Me- have uh, a quick sorry. response. Okay. okay. Well, certainly, you know, I use the term new structural economics, so there must be something in common with, you know, structuralism. Just like when we talk about new institutional economics, there must be something in common with institutional school. But there's one major difference. In the structuralism, economic structure was treated as exogenous. Since you treat economic structure as endogenous, exogenous, you think the government can change that by your inspiration without considering what should be the necessary condition for that kind of sector to be viable. But in the new structural economics, Economic structure is endogenous. And as I said, it's endogenous to your endowment structure. If you do not change your endowment structure first, you try to change your economic structure, then that kind of structure will go against your competitive advantages. They are not viable. Then you need to require government protection and subsidies uh, 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 to make that kind of in a non viable firm to survive. And, but in the new structural economics, because the industry you targeted are consistent with the competitive advantages determined by your endowment structure. And certainly you need to have the government to facilitate that to overcome the coordination issue in the improvement of infrastructure, education, human capital, financial sectors. You also need to have a compensation to the first movers to give them some incentive. But as I mentioned at the end, in the old structural economics, old structuralism, how come they failed? Because the sector they tried to develop, going against the country's competitive advantages, firm are now viable. And all the government distortion interventions, protection, try to address the issue of viability issue. And in the new structural economics, the government intervention is only try to address the issue of externality. Once you overcome the externality issue and a coordination issue, the firm will be viable. The sector can be competitive. But in the old structuralism, the sectors, even you build up, they are not competitive. Firm in those kind of sectors are not viable. In general, they become some kind of, you know, old, some kind of white elephants. So as I said, certainly, you know, this is the distinguishing between the new structural economics and the structuralism, just like the distinguishing between the, you know, new institutional economics and the old institutional school. Certainly, a lot of tools, the appearance seem to be similar, but the spirit is different. Okay. Thank you. And second question from Dimas, Mohammed. Um, thank you. Xie uh, Xie for your presentation, Professor. I'm a big fan. I'm a big believer in industrial policy myself. But it has, as has been mentioned by the discussions, 
in Indonesia, there appears to be pervasive skepticism, if not hostility towards industrial policy because of the trauma from our past failures in industrial policy, including in the airplane and the national car industry. So they often say industrial policy might have worked in China, Korea, Japan, but not in Indonesia. Indonesia is exceptionally horrible in industrial policy. The government should just stick to building roads, building schools, and that's it. Let the market do everything else. What would you say to people with such view that Indonesia is not just destined to do industrial policy properly? Thank you. Well, I see those kind of hostility to industrial policy, not only in Indonesia. Almost in the intellectual communities, everywhere in the developing country. And also in the international development institutions. You know, when I was the chief economist of the World Bank from 2008 and 2012, when I started to promote my new structural economics to show all the successful countries, they use industrial policies. Although, you know, most industrial policies fail. But we did not see any country to catch up without industrial policies. And so the appropriate approach should be trying to understand how come most industrial policy fail. And also to understand how come if you do not have industrial policy, rely on only market spontaneous forces, you never see a country to catch up. And that should be the right approach. And that is the spirit of new structural economics. That's the reason why I promote the new structural economics. So in a way, we often have you know, a phrase like throwing the baby out together with the bus waters. If you say because industrial policy in the past failed, and then industrial policy became a taboo, and uh, you advise the government should never use industrial policy and rely on market spontaneous forces. That kind of approach has been 30 years. And we see in that 30 years, country follow the philosophy. They face the issue of deindustrialization. Their economic growth was even lower than the period of time that they practice industrial policy. As I mentioned, yes, the industrial policy in Indonesia had a lot of problems because they target one sectors. But at the same time, from 1967 to 1997, the average annual growth rate was 6.8% for 30 years. And now, after that, you gave up the industrial policy. What was your growth rate? You know better than I do. Thank you. And so I think it's a time for us to rethink. I do not say that we should do industrial policy to do everything. But if we want to do the right things, industrial policy is essential. Thank you, Professor Ling. And next question is from Desi Peng. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Professor Justin. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, how can we avoid rent-seeking activities that will be endogenous to the business environment since most industrial policy lead to high rent-seeking behavior? Uh, and empirically, strong government intervention could lead to incompetent firms and also reduce the industry's competitiveness. And the second question is how you place trade, li trade liberalization and multilateral arrangement in the context of industrial policy since you propose subsidies that uh, currently it is hardly, hardly to implement in the current global governance. And um, maybe you can show some countries that have successful industrial policies in the uh, recent uh, era, Professor Justin. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, very good. You know, if you in a developing country, in general, you have very poor business environment. And that's a fact. But if you look into a few fast growing economies, like my own country, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, their business environment are also very poor, are also very poor. But they are able to grow very rapidly. 
That's what I recommend in my speech to use a very pragmatic way to set up special economic zone and industrial parks within the zone. You improve the high infrastructure. Within the zone, you adopt one-stop services. And immediately within that on crates, you can have very good business environment. Transaction cost in that on crates can be very low. And use that as a way to attract foreign direct investment or domestic investment. And also use that as a way to encourage you know, clusters. Then under the kind of situation, even all oh, your business environment is very poor nationwide, like China, like Vietnam, like Cambodia. But you can have very dynamic, you know, industrial upgrading, industrial development. I think that it should be the pragmatic way that in a country with a very poor business environment. Otherwise, for example, when I was a chief economist, as a chief economist of the World Bank, I received, you know, I met with the Minister of Finance from Burkina Faso. And he complained to me last year, your institution recommend us to do reform in the business environment. The item was more than 200 items for us to improve. Then he said, we did not even have 200 staff in my ministries. How can we carry out 200 reform to improve the business environment? But my recommendation was much simpler. Shut our industrial park. Within the industrial park, apply one-stop service. Liberalize everything within the industrial park. Every country will be able to do that. And within this own crate, it can be a jump, a jumping you know, path for further development and further reform in the countries. So that's my way. And also, you know, I already mentioned in the sector which you identify, you try to develop, it's consistent with your competitive advantages. You do not need to give them subsidies and protections. What you need to do is only to improve the business environment and hot infrastructure within the own grade. And to give some kind of tax incentive to compensate for the first mover. Or if you have foreign exchange control, to give them some kind of access to foreign exchanges, and especially you can link those kind of access to their expo. Then those kind of, you know, that kind of incentive is very small. It's not really a rent. Then you can overcome the issue. You know, in the past, we need to give rent or, you know, subsidies. Only you try to be too ambitious, like you want to develop national car, you want to develop your plan, they are not your country's comparative advantages from are not viable. Then you need to subsidize them. And those kind of subsidies become some kind of rent, and then you're going to rent again. Thank you. And the next one is from Hell Hill. Yes, uh, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Hi, uh, uh, Justin, it's very nice to see you. Uh, long yeah. time, you look very well. Uh, uh, and thanks for your very stimulating presentation. We remember you coming to ANU every year for a long time. It was always a highlight. Uh, I, I like the way you've addressed these issues very broadly, the history, you know, the comparative analysis, and, you know, the intersection between market and state is always a tricky one. Uh, and, and thank you also to Dr. Kiki and, and Dr. Eddie for their useful comments. Justin, uh, I wonder whether you want to perhaps be a little bit more explicit on the sort of political economy framework which underpins your analysis um, and, and how, where, where, your, where your advice might work better in a sense you, you've implicitly answered it because you pointed out the countries that have graduated, mainly in East Asia. And so the story, I guess, implicitly or maybe explicitly is open economies, uh, you know, transparency and scrutiny when you're allocating resources, having sunset clauses, uh, going in just going industry level rather than firm level, trying to avoid capture, all that sort of stuff. And so 
Uh, I wonder whether your, uh, your analysis ha has to be modulated depending on your assessment of institutional capacities. Uh, in the sense, you know, states can range from hard states, high governance, through to, I guess, what you might call predatory states. And then a lot are in between, the sort of muddling through states. So I'm just wondering whether you want to tell us a little bit more about that. I think you've written about it elsewhere. And if I can just add a related point to Indonesia, which came up in Dr. Kiki's presentation, but also the other speakers. As you correctly point out, Indonesia has had high growth, you know, 7% plus for several decades. That's why it was called an, a, a miracle economy in the early 90s by the bank. And I guess the question is whether uh, at that time of high growth, the Indonesian government was really following the kind of strategies that you were advocating. So in some senses, of course, yes, but in other senses, as uh, Kiki and others have pointed out, a lot of their industrial policy was not actually, uh, was sort of counterproductive. Um, so the sort of question therefore the, is, you know, can you have the growth uh, without, the, without this framework? And it suggests Indonesia possibly has. But uh, just throwing out questions and once again, lovely to see you, at least on the screen and thank you. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, very good comments on my presentations and uh, so nice to see you on the screen. I hope certainly I can come to visit, you know, ANU in person, but to see you on the screen is a very good alternative. Thank you. But anyway, certainly we need to consider the political economy issue and the, as you mentioned, I discussed that in other lectures. You know, I have my Marshall Lectures 2007 published as a book and I discussed more in that. Just to be Brief. Certainly, all this policy need to be put in the political setup. But my position is that no matter, no matter what kind of political setup, the leadership has enough discretionary power to implement the recommendation in the new structural economics. Uh, 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 and uh, to support, to set up on great special economic zone, and in that zone to support the development of the industry that the country has competitive advantages, and uh, to allow the zone to grow dynamically. And uh, with the dynamic growing of those kind of zones, then the leadership can have more resources and expand those kind of you know policy to a larger area, and gradually you cover you know more region, more country, more 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 more, more you know more parts of the country. And uh, no matter you are an authoritarian regime or you are democratic in the regime, because the president, the leaders, always have sufficient you know discretionary power if they you know, just do it in a very pragmatic way. And the political leader will have the incentive to do that if they really understand this approach. Because this approach certainly to their interest. If you can you know, have some programs and show this program has been so successful, so effective, and provide the hope and direction for the nations, then you are going to get more support. No matter you in a in a democratic system or in an authoritarian system, and uh, and uh, from what I see, Indonesia has sufficient, you know, uh, possibility institutional capacity to do that, because in the past before 1997, Indonesia, you know, adopted the import substitution strategies, with all kind of distortions. If they can implement all kind of distortions for 30 years, that might mean they have sufficient institutional capacity to do that, right? But as you mentioned, uh, you know, if you observe in 1967 to 97, the average growth rate was about 7%. But it become unsustainable only because, you know, you try to be too ambitious. Partly because of your aspiration, you want to aeroplane industry, you want to have a national car industries. Partly it may be related to Russ Gano lecture mentioned the resources boom, get the Indonesia the resources to invest in those kind of luxury industries. 
And so that's the reason why, at the end, I mentioned you need to have a good management of resources and to avoid the, you know, the resources from a curse to become operation. And, 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 and the reason why the growth before 1997 was not sustainable was because, you know, Indonesia wanted to develop many sectors which went against their compare advantages. But we should not throw the baby, baby you know, out together with the bus water. The government intervention in a way that comes to, to help the sector of their latent compare advantages to become their competitiveness would be essential for Indonesia. And from my point of view, also any country to you know, get out of middle income trap. And this framework should be applicable to country, no matter they are authoritarian or they are democratic. And one good example is Mauritius. Mauritius is a democratic country in a system, you know, but now they are most successful uh, 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 African country. And in the 1960s, it's a country considered as hopeless because they did not have any condition which are considered essential for a country to be successful. But they are most successful country. But if you study Mauritius carefully, their economic development and their transition strategies were very close to what I described in my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Krishna Gupta. Um, hello. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Professor Justin, um, for your presentation. It's, um, I like your batik shirt, by the way. It looks lovely. Amazing discussion uh, up till now. I just want to add one more discussion a bit on uh, the fiscal policies. You mentioned a lot of fiscal incentives needs to be done. Government needs to do lots of projects. Um, but at the same time, you suggest the government to save revenue from resources. Um, isn't it's a little bit contradictive, especially Indonesian government has been running a deficit budget since Asian financial crisis. So a little bit touch on the fiscal uh, perspective will be lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I, as I said, I'm not an expert of Indonesia, so I may say something not relevant or even nonsense. And uh, currently Indonesia's, you know, encounter fiscal deficit. It's a situation. But even if you have a fiscal deficit, you also have an issue how to allocate the use of the fiscal resources. If you use the fiscal resources in a way to support the growth, then with the growth, the government revenue will be improved. And, and by that, you know, you can, you know, take the what I recommend in the lecture is some kind of reference to do the right things. Uh, uh, that might be the way to treat it with the fiscal uh, issue in Indonesia now. Because if you want to improve the fiscal situation, I think the best way is to invest in growth. Thank you. The next question is uh, asked to be not live. So I'll just read the question. It's from Pantitra. She said, good morning from Thailand. What is your view on minimum wage and labor welfare, welfare reduction for the purpose of investment attraction and economic growth? And to be more specific, on the recent omnibus bill in Indonesia, uh, just on the omnibus bill, uh, one part of it just uh, trying to deregulate the labor market, uh, reduce the labor market regulations. Uh, so, Professor Ling, do you have any comments? Uh, again, I do not know the specific labor market regulation in Indonesia. And my general position is that some kind of minimum wages may be desirable. But the best way to set minimum wages is to set the minimum wage lower than the market wage rate. Then under the kind of situation, it provides some kind of protection to the workers. But it will not raise the wage rate too high to make the industry which you should have compared advantages to lose compared advantages. That might be the way to, to, to you know, couple with the issues. Thank you. Uh, we may have a question. Sorry, time for uh, one more question. And that's from Risky Nauli. Now Hi, uh, 
Hi, good. Actually, evening from California. Very interesting, pa, uh, Professor Lin. My question is, um, how should we frame industrial policies in the world of global value chains or production networks? Meaning that there is no one particular product that you produce alone. So it needs to be uh, fragmented into tasks. Another question is that uh, there is a new recent study that shows industrial policy that provides tax subsidy to workers, so not firms, actually work. So do you think in the current era of rampant automation and rom robotizations, does it matter which agent that the government support, that is whether it's better to in incentivize workers to accumulate skills or better to incentivize firms? Thank you. Uh the first one certainly now most of the global you know trade global production are organized in global value chains but global value chain does not deviate from the concept of competitive advantages in this global value chain you focus on areas tasks or components which you have competitive advantages and then you know, you participate in the global value chain through trade, final product may not be produced in your country, but the production of components or tasks in your country are still consistent with your comparable advantages. Just like China is considered as a global factory and China export a lot of labor intensive or now mid range, you know, product like electronics and so on. But each year, China need to import about 40% of what we export in order to support the export. So China, you know, participate in the in, in the global value chain. And so uh, in this current situation, certainly, if you want to be competitive in the international trade, you need to be part of the global value chains. Then, you know, to, 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 to give incentive, or to you know educate people as i said in my talk you know it's not a policy for the whole nation you need to look into sector by sectors and you see in that sectors you know if you want to develop that kind of sector certainly you need to provide some incentive for the entrepreneur especially for the first movers but you also need to what kind of bottleneck for the development of those kind of sectors education or access to finance and so on. And then the government should help them to remove those kind of bottlenecks. So uh, that will be uh, a more effective policy than to talk, you know, either or. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but it certainly has been a very good lecture and will leave us as uh, all of us leaving thinking. So on behalf of uh, Indonesia Project and all the 300 audience, let me thank all the uh, three speakers, uh, Professor Lin, Professor Variko, and Professor Punawan. Thank you so much for uh, participating. And thank, thank, thank you everyone for joining this lecture. And then we hope to see you next year or in other uh, events of the Indonesia project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very and, much, um, Mr. Justin. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you, you, Professor. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paidi. Thank you, Mahal. Well, the thank final you. message I'd like to have is that well, yeah, I'm strongly convinced by Sarah, if kasih. Indonesia can grow at 7% for 20 years, Hopefully, then Indonesia oh, will turn from a mid-income country to a high-income country. And I do see the potential there. And so sure. how to tap into the potential, hope my so, talk contribute a little bit of your thinking. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Justin. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Terima kasih. Bye bye. Ya, mahal. Hi, Edi. Hi. Thank you. Lydia juga. Hi, Lydia. Hello, mahal. Thank you, Professor Lin. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again.